Perhaps you uh, grew up with stories of the three wise men coming to visit Jesus shortly after his birth, bringing gifts from the east. Or maybe you had a nativity showing them dressed as kings with robes and crowns. Or maybe you have no idea what I'm talking about. Regardless, uh, I have some bad news for you if you were in one of the first two camps. And that is, they weren't wise men, and they were not kings. They were magi. That's the original Greek uh, for the word, the original Greek word that's in the Bible for these representing these people. And the reason we've changed that for ourselves over time, over the years, is to soften the blow of how that would feel and how it did feel, this word magi. And we wanted to soften the blow from what Matthew actually in his uh, uh, gospel was trying to communicate. Because he was trying to communicate, what he was trying to communicate was, frankly, it was shocking. And honestly, it would make the church look really bad. So we took the Bible and we sort of softened it up a bit in our songs and in our Christmas traditions. You see, magi were magicians. We get our word magician from it. This exact word magi is actually translated later in the book of Acts as sorcerer, all right? They were astrologers, which makes sense because they were taking direction from a star, right? It's all adding up now. The problem? Well, sorcery is bad in the Bible. Astrology is bad in the Bible. These two concepts were pretty heavily frowned upon and continue to be frowned upon pretty heavily in Christianity. In fact, catch this, in Leviticus chapter 20, the punishment for being a medium or a spiritist was the exact same punishment for being gay or homosexual. And that punishment was death. So it was pretty hardcore. And you were pretty hardcore bad if you were one of those people. So the fact that it's these types of people who show up first <coughs> is somewhat embarrassing if you're the church, if you know what I mean. And we find ourselves here in the time of King Herod in Matthew 2, is what it says. And Matthew is trying to set the stage for us to help us see how shocking and unnerving this entire event is going to be, even though we've really calmed it down and we've taken all the edge and horror out of it for our Christmas traditions. So Matthew is setting the stage, reminding us that this is the time of King Herod. And what we don't know or what we've forgotten is that King Herod was one of the most vicious rulers in the Roman Empire. Caesar Augustus had said of Herod that it'd be better to be a pig in Herod's house than one of his kids. You see, racially, Herod, Herod was an Arab, and politically he was Roman, but religiously he was Jewish. And since he was Jewish, he couldn't eat pork. Therefore, if you were a pig in Herod's house, you're all set. However, he killed three of his sons to stay in power because staying in power, as you probably know, is all that matters to most politicians. But here they come, right? Here they come, the Magi. Magi from the East, it says. Imagine if, they, if this word were actually translated the same way as it is in Acts. Let's call them sorcerers, shall we? So in Matthew it says, and so sorcerers from the east came to Jerusalem. And you already, so the whole thing already feels different, doesn't it? What happens if we call them condemned idolaters? And we said, this, said it this way, instead of saying three kings or three wives, let's just call them condemned idolaters. Condemned idolaters from the east came to Jerusalem and they were asking, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star and we've come to worship him. Hello, we are condemned idolaters, we're sorcerers and somewhat astrologers, and we're looking to worship Jesus. Can you imagine? Hello, we're the people that the Bible has warned you about, and we're here to worship Jesus. His star, ironically, has told us where to find him. We've been listening to the stars. That's what's happening here. And if this wasn't actually in the Bible, we'd probably call it witchcraft and heresy. Stars don't talk. Instead, we celebrate it. Today, we put stars on our trees. 
unaware of how just grotesque this would have looked to Matthew's audience. In our culture, maybe it would be the similar to saying, uh, putting a pride flag, right? And, 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 and being, becoming aware that a pride flag has led a bunch of homosexuals looking for Jesus. And we'd say, no way, no way. No way is that going on my Christmas tree as a Christian, right? So with stars upon our Christmas trees, um, we're just not shocked. Like we would have been shocked if we would have been the church back then. Back then, it would have been horrifying. Yeah, back then, it would have been ridiculous and heretical, you know, until it happens, and it did happen. The problem is even worse, because in this context, like Matthew's talking about, these magi, these sorcerers, they're looking for the king of the Jews, but they've come looking for the king of the Jews, but they're not looking for Herod. And remember, Caesar Augustus gave Herod that title. That's his title. Herod is the king of the Jews. This is Herod's time. And he didn't want to see his time end anytime soon, which is why he killed his sons, right? So to Herod, this is treason. So when the king heard this, this says in, in, chapter, in verse 3, when King Herod heard this, he was troubled, it says, for obvious reasons. And it turns out all of Jerusalem was troubled with him. You see, like parts of the modern church today, Jerusalem had something of a political alliance with a man they know probably wasn't a really good person, right? I mean, he was Jewish, so he's kind of at least claims to be part of our religion, right? Um, but yet he killed his sons. He's a murderer. But they seem to somehow coexist and empower each other to kind of stay in power, right? Which, frankly, friends, this is what's happening today. This is our world. So here he is, a murderer of his own family, Jewish. Um, but regardless, whatever you do, you don't want this man mad at you. Does it sound familiar? You don't want this man mad at you. So the church prefers to keep the peace, right? They prefer to keep the peace, keep Herod calm. We're kind of got this alliance. Let's just keep him calm. Rather, they prefer to do that rather than believe the Messiah, who they've been waiting for their entire existence, rather than believe the Messiah has actually shown up, they're going to try and keep the peace, right? Especially right? Especially when the news comes from a bunch of magi, sorcerers, a bunch of sorcerers following a star. Yeah, we're going to trust them, right? We're going to trust those idolaters. We're going to trust those condemned people who, don't, who, who, who have been ostracized by the entire Bible. We're not going to trust them that somehow they know where the Messiah is after talking to a star. So the church doesn't believe him. But you know what? Politicians are different. Herod, he's not taking any chances. So when Herod, he calls the chief priests and scribes together, and he asks where the Messiah is to be born. See, politicians will leverage whatever they can to achieve their goals, and their goal is to stay in power, right? So they will leverage the church if they need to. And the church, a lot of times, is very willing to be leveraged, to oblige, because it makes them feel good about themselves, that somebody as powerful as Herod wants to talk with us about what we think, right? It's kind of cool. So you've got some alignment here, and that messes things up, especially when this alignment and the, your own personal goals begin to conflict. And it got so difficult here for the church that they even bend their own scripture to smooth this out a little bit for Herod. Watch this. So Herod, he calls them all together and he asks them, you know, where's the Messiah to be found? And so in verse 5, it says, so they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for it has been written, and about to quote their own scriptures here, and, and quoting Micah, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people. And the problem with that in Micah 5, 2, is the word shepherd doesn't exist. So they actually inserted a word. The actual 
translation, what you find in Micah 5.2, which is what they're quoting, is from, from you shall come forth one who is to rule in Israel. That is going to hit Herod hard. A lot harder than being a shepherd. Shepherd my people. That feels a lot. I mean, nobody cared about shepherds either. They were homeless. They lived out in fields watching sheep. Right? Who cared about them? So they thought, we're just going to change the verse a little bit so it doesn't hit him so hard. So they misquote their own Bible to serve their own needs, right? And not to anger the politicians. Folks, this is what we're living. This is us, all right? It's happening now. So Herod, again, being a consummate politician, he plays both sides of the coin. Not only does he talk to the church and get their feedback, but guess what else he does? He goes to get some feedback from the Magi, the sorcerers, right? It says this in verse 7. Herod secretly called them, though, because he doesn't want to get caught. He doesn't want to get busted by the church talking to the bad people, right? Getting feedback from the sinners and the sorcerers and the astrologers. That would look, that'd be a bad look. I mean, he's aligned with the Jewish church. So he, he needs to do this part secretly. And he learned from them the exact time when the star appeared. So then Herod sent them, verse 8, he sent them to the Bethlehem. See, he won't go himself. And he sends them to Bethlehem saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may go and worship him. This, folks, is fake worship, right? He has, you know this. You know this. He has no intention of worshiping Jesus. But he'll pretend to if that gets him what he needs to stay in power. Listen to me. He has no, these people have, Herod's got no intention of worshiping Jesus, but he will if it gets him what he needs to stay in power. He will pretend to, all right? He will pretend to if that helps him stay in power. So the Magi, they consult the stars about where to find Jesus. The sorcerers, the astrologers, they consult the stars. A star tells them. The church, they consult their Bible. And politicians do a little bit of everything, right? Whatever helps. Magi, stars, church, Bible, politicians, a little bit of everything. And they all point to the same place. Only, 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 only the sinners, the sorcerers, actually go look. Only the sorcerers the condemned idolaters, actually go look for Jesus. The church and the politicians, they don't do anything except twist their Bible and try to stay in power. The church and the politicians do nothing except twist the Bible and try and stay in power. When they heard this, when they heard the king, the magi, they set out. And there ahead of them went the star. They didn't need Herod. These sinners, they didn't need Herod. These sinners didn't need the church to find Jesus. A star led them. Their pride flag led them to the Savior. A star, the symbol of their idolatry, led them. Politicians won't lead people to Jesus, no matter how religious they pretend to be, folks. In a politically motivated church, they're not going to lead people to the Christ either, even though they know exactly where to find him. So Jesus, here's what Jesus will do. And this is what Matthew wanted us to feel. He wanted us to be shocked at what Jesus is about to do. Jesus will lead people to himself, unexpected people, sinners, people the church believes to be sinners and grotesque, outliers, abandonable, and they, those sinners, those sorcerers, they're going to hear his voice from inside their own idolatry and sin. A star will tell them where to find Jesus. Because the church and the politicians are impotent. So the post-Christmas message, the Christian message, is a warning 
It's a warning to those in power who use fake interest in Jesus and quote scriptures to further their hold on power and a warning to the church if it's willing to twist their own Bible all right, to be played by the, by the political leaders in power. Folks, this is not an ancient story. This is a constant story. This is today's, this is our story. And this is about people who ultimately come to Christ, sinners, laughed at by the church because of their lifestyle, because of their beliefs, who Jesus is calling, even now, to come worship him, despite their beliefs and lifestyle. And in fact, he's calling them through their beliefs and lifestyle. Is that possible? Is that shocking to us? Is that shocking to you? It was shocking to Matthew, and he wants us to be shocked at the possibility of what Jesus could actually do. So church, be warned. Politicians, be warned. Those we've labeled sinners and idolaters and horrible people, rejoice. For the Lord Jesus is calling you to come worship him. And he will show you exactly how to find him, even when the rest of us fail to do so. So this star, verse 9, they follow it until it stops over the place where the child was. And they were overwhelmed with joy. Can you imagine? Kicked out by the church, ostracized by everybody, and he calls you. And when they get there, they are overwhelmed with joy. And entering the house, they saw Jesus with Mary, it says. And they fell down. And they worshipped him. And the church and the politicians were nowhere to be seen. <laughs>